All right. Um, so I am um, Dr. Richard Blatchford. I'm an extension specialist at University of California, Davis in the Department of Animal Science. And um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about some tools or thoughts about reducing floor eggs. Um, just a quick sort of history about floor egg research. Um, a lot of research was actually done back in the 70s, 80s, and most of it um, involved broiler breeders uh, and trying to get them to stop laying on the floor and into nest boxes. Um, and then we sort of don't really see very much happening um, after the 80s, and it's sort of become a new thing again, uh, particularly as people have started moving layers into cage free production, um, how, how to get them to stop laying on the floor. So I'll talk a little bit about some of that newer research at the end. Um, and I did want to make a note about nesting behavior. So nesting behavior in general is a very complex series of seeking behavior and ultimately leads to building um, of a nest. As we know, chickens have a very rudimentary nest, but they do make one. Um, and so that the environment is ready for when that hen is ready to lay her egg. And because it's related to that laying of the egg, um, these behaviors are actually tied to hormones that are involved in ovulation. So it's really difficult to get rid of some of these behaviors or to reduce some of these nest seeking, nest making behaviors um, because they are so closely tied to egg production. So if you mess with those behaviors, you tend to mess with egg production. Um, and also that through, through all the research that's been done, we know that, that these behaviors, these nesting behaviors are really um, variable. So they vary considerably between birds, um, sometimes within one bird throughout her life cycle um, and between flocks. Sometimes you can have flocks that have very little um, floor laying and the next flock you have in, suddenly you have a really large amount. Um, and it's, sort of, it's really unclear about what's actually causing that to happen. So why do we get floor eggs? Um, essentially, it's because this nest seeking behavior kind of goes wonky in terms of the environments that we put laying hens into. So birds are typically attracted to non-nest box areas, um, and it could be because of the location. Um, so they don't like where the nest boxes are. They don't like the way the nest boxes are set up, um, the design of the nest boxes or there could be some social attraction. And we also know that sometimes they're attracted to where the eggs, actually seeing the eggs in certain places that can trigger them to, to think of that as a nesting area. And through research, we know that there are various factors that contribute to floor eggs. Um, rearing conditions, housing conditions for layers, uh, adult birds, nest box design and management. And I'm gonna go through um, each of these in a little bit more detail. So rearing conditions, um, this is especially important now um, as we are transitioning into cage-free production. Um, what do our, what, how do we raise the pullets to be most successful in those cage-free uh, housing systems as adults? And so a lot of work is being done right now looking at pullet um, housing and pullet conditions. So we know that in the pullet phase that the birds start to develop um, nesting preferences. And the environment that they're raised in can really influence um, where they sort of decide um, nest, nest should be. And so there's an example in the literature, um, this is with broiler breeders, but they raise some birds in dark, dark environments and some birds in a lighted environment. And that actually influenced whether or not they wanted to go to a darker nest box or lighter nest box. So we know that there are things in the environment and people now are trying to figure out what are those things and how can we best support the pullets in terms of their development um, for later nesting preferences. Mobility is really important. So <clears throat> because in most of our cage-free production systems, nests are off the floor, giving the birds access as pullets to the ability to go up and down is really, really important. And actually that's important for a lot of different things, but we'll just focus on nesting today. Um, it's really important that pullets learn to jump and utilize vertical space. So they need to know, it's, it, they're birds, so it's sort of counterintuitive for us to think that vertical space is not something that comes natural to them, but it really doesn't. Um, they have to have experience and practice with it. 
So giving them that ability, so providing purchase, um, giving them a raised platform that they can go up and down off of is really important. And doing that um, before four weeks of age or by four weeks of age seems to be really that, that sort of threshold age limit. Um, also doing that will provide them the ability to develop physical attributes that allow that vertical movement as adults. So you're really priming their muscular system, um, their sort of spatial abilities, um, cognitive function, and allowing them to be able to, to go up and down uh, in a better way. The housing design of rearing conditions is also important. So as I said, uh, making sure that you have some sort of ability for them to, to practice up and down. Um, they will start perching at small heights um, by two weeks of age. Um, and then they just increase that. Um, the, more the more practice you give them, the different heights that they have available, the more they'll utilize those sorts of things. As very young birds, so you know, less than two or three weeks of age, you can also provide ramps for them to move up and down uh, and they will eventually switch over from ramp use to more of that jumping up and down uh, as their physical abilities become more developed. Um, also, we know that allowing pullets to inspect nest boxes pre-lay is also really important. There's some evidence that the earlier that they can do that, um, the more likely they will be to lay in nest boxes and not lay on the floor when they're moved into the um, adult housing system. We don't really know, um, again, this is sort of newer research that's going on right now. And so we don't really know exactly when that should be. Um, so that's a question we are waiting to find out uh, and people are trying to investigate. In terms of housing conditions for, for the actual adult housing, um, mobility of the birds is really important. So again, access to vertical structures. So giving them perches in that environment, um, having them be able to easily move throughout the environment is really important in terms of them getting, getting to that nest box. You don't want to impede them in any way and give them um, a reason to say, well, I don't really want to go to this particular area because it's hard to get to, so I'm just gonna lay on the floor because that's easier. Um, there's been a lot of work looking at things like lighting, um, substrate within the nest box. So you put loose litter in there, do you put astroturf, what's the best sort of thing? Um, temperature, so warmer areas or cooler areas better. And then there's really conflicting evidence of whether or not that may actually affect, affect floor laying. Um, the more sort of general trend is that no, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of these a little bit when we talk about nest design. Uh, yeah, nest box design. The one thing we know is that perching um, in the pullets and with the adult birds is really important. So you, you want the birds to be able to perform perching behavior, to be able to jump up onto a perch um, or an alighting rail, and that you want to have something in front of the nest boxes for them to be able to jump up onto and then easily step into the nest box. So I have a couple examples here. We all know what nest, these nest boxes look like in commercial production. Um, so in the top photo, we have uh, an alighting rail um, and a little bit of a platform. So you can see that that perch runs on the very outside of that flat, short platform area, and then they can step up into the nest box area from there. Um, and in the lower picture, this is more sort of what you might see in a, a floor house barn with maybe some slats. Um, included, but you can see that at the front of the slats, there's a bit of a, of a space there so that they can use that first slat as a, almost as an alighting rail um, to get up. And then um, you can see here, these are individual nest boxes and oftentimes they come with some sort of perch or lighting rail right in front of the box. And so that also allows the birds, even if it's in front of a platform, that ability to easily step up into that nest box area. So you want them to be able to move very freely into those nest boxes. I will make one short note. Um, we'll talk a little bit about strains in a bit and I, I might have covered this in a, a slide further on, but I'll cover it now. Um, we do know that brown birds and white birds, um, there's more and more and more evidence coming out that they're behaviorally very distinct. Um, and so brown birds we know are very rigid in terms of the timing of lay. And so you can have a very small window of time in which most of the birds are laying eggs, which means that spacing um, 
and, and the ability of birds to access nest boxes without a lot of competition is, is much more important. Um, it's very important for both strains, but much more important for brown birds because they are more likely to engage in high competition um, for nesting areas. So you don't want birds to feel like they can't get into the nest box area and so then they just go and lay on the floor. White birds, on the other hand, tend to be much more uh, flexible in terms of time of lay. And so if there's a lot of competition and a bird really wants to get into that nest box, she can actually hold off laying her egg um, to a later time when it's not so busy um, and then utilize those. That can also backfire um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So nest box design, um, you know, you sort of think here's a box that a bird can go into, what more can you do with it? There's actually a lot um, of different factors that, that birds will consider when choosing whether a nest box is what they're looking for in a nest. Um, so the things that we sort of all know um, and have been taught is that if it's a darkened area um, and a somewhat secluded area, that that makes it much more attractive to the hen. And that is true. Um, so hens typically prefer a darker, more secluded area to a, a, a more brightly busy area, brightly lit busy area. And that, that sort of evolutionary history um, about where they're trying to find nests and keeping it away from predators and, and other competition. Um, but it's not actually necessarily linked to floor eggs. Um, so whether or not they like that the nest box is dark and secluded doesn't necessarily tie with um, any sort of amount of floor laying within the flock. Substrate is very important in terms of um, needing something in that nest box. They don't like bare metal, they don't like bare wire. Um, they really do prefer loose particles. Um, obviously, in terms of the machinery and things that go into our, our cage systems, that can be very problematic. So one of the things that might drive them onto the floor is that ability to manipulate um, the litter uh, and move it around because that's, that's something that they want to do as part of that um, nest seeking, nest making behavior. But the only time that you really see an effect in terms of floor eggs with substrate is if there is no substrate available at all. So the AstroTurf that's most common um, and fairly easy to clean will suffice um, in terms of them needing to fulfill that sort of substrate area. Harsh slopes can be a big issue in terms of birds wanting to use nest boxes. Um, we know that harsh slopes are very aversive to the birds. They don't like being on those. They don't like sitting on harsh slopes. Um, but I think today with most of the major cage manufacturers, that's not really, not really an issue that they've taken that into account. Um, and we, we tend to see um, less harsh sloping in terms of nest box flooring. We also know that presence of eggs or other hens can be a driver um, of birds using nest boxes. So birds are more likely to lay eggs um, when they see other eggs present or there's a lot of birds in that area. So we know that social attraction, uh, as with lots of other behaviors, is a, is a key driver here. So I know we don't want eggs sitting around um, in nest boxes, but in terms of um, putting birds into a system and trying to get them trained into the, to using those nest boxes, perhaps putting dummy eggs in for the first couple of weeks might be something that will help drive the birds um, into those areas uh, and know that this is somewhere where I need to lay eggs and sort of stop them from, from starting um, to lay on the floor in the first place. So the last sort of influence of this is really management. And this is where um, you come in, in terms of what you do with your birds. So the major thing that I think all of you probably have done at some point, um, whether it's successful or not, is training, trying to train the birds to go to the nest boxes when they're put into the layer houses. And we know here that systematic training is really important. So being very consistent and doing it flock wide. Um, and you may have to do it for longer than you actually want to do it. The downside to that is that it's very laborious. Um, um, you know, there are different ways to try to do this. They all take labor. Um, and if you're having to do it for four or five weeks, that's a lot of labor and a lot of time that you have to put into this. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that you can try to train birds. Um, probably one of the more common because it's somewhat less laborious 
um, is the disturbance or of birds who are we think are, are going to lay on the floor um, or destruction of floorness. Although those aren't really likely to work. So short term, they may work. You may disturb the hens. Um, they may go up into the nest boxes because they're about ready to lay their eggs uh, and you've disturbed them from where they were on the floor. But the next day they're gonna go straight back down to the floor. So it's a really short term kind of solution. We know in terms of longer term solution, um, that actually physically placing the hens, taking them off the floor and putting them up into um, a nest box works much better long term. Um, obviously that's much more labor intensive. Um, it may be something you have to do for a number of weeks before they stop doing that. Um, the other thing is that we know temporary confinement within a nest box um, or a nest box area is actually pretty effective. But again, that has somewhat short term consequences. Um, so a study was done where they, they basically put the hens in a nest box, confined her to the nest box um, for 30 minutes. And they were able to reduce floor laying um, within those groups from about 24% down to 1%. And then they let the birds, they stopped restraining the birds. Um, and they saw that, that that decrease maintained for several weeks, but eventually, floor eggs started to accumulate again and they got back to those original numbers. So it wasn't something that was, it was very long-term, um, but it did have some, some amount of um, utility. Uh, as I mentioned, strain differences are something that you need to consider in terms of um, how you manage the birds and, and what you actually do for, the, for those birds. So differences in time of lay, as I, as I explained before, uh, white strains tend to be much more flexible in terms of when they lay. Um, space needs, so you wanna make sure that you have enough um, nesting space and that can get, sounds like an easy thing, but it can get very complicated, especially when you take these differences in lay time into account. Do you need more nesting space at one time for brown birds versus maybe a little bit less? Um, for white birds, because we know that, that they don't necessarily utilize them all at the same time. Um, and space, nest space requirements really are something that we don't know very much about. Um, any of you who are certified through third party auditing um, companies know that we, there, there is a number threshold. Um, that number threshold is you know, something that, that's not based on a lot of evidence. So more work needs to be done in terms of understanding, especially in these large scale flocks, um, how do the birds actually use those nests and what, what are the space needs that we, that we need to provide for them? Um, and then we also know that strains, it's becoming more and more clear as people look at strain differences that brown birds and white birds utilize the entire cage-free system very differently. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about that outside of this. Um, one of the things that, that can really work well, um, and perhaps is a little bit of an upfront um, cost in terms of materials and labor, but maybe may pay off in the long run, um, are exclusion of problem areas. So we know that birds in systems where they have access um, underneath the systems, and it's fairly low to the ground and pretty dark, that you tend to see really large amounts of um, floor eggs underneath the system. And I've actually worked with some um, producers where the birds, they were able to keep the birds inside. So they had a system like this top photo where you can actually close the birds in to the system. They kept them in till about um, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning when they thought that most of the birds had laid their eggs, open it up um, so the birds can get access to the litter. And so many birds, and these were white birds, so remember that they can hold off laying um, immediately would run straight under um, the system and lay their eggs. So closing them off didn't, didn't work at, at that point. So actually closing off underneath that the system is what works. So they did that and um, much fewer eggs were laid on the floor because the aisleways uh, and the open litter areas were brightly lit uh, and the birds didn't like that. So they started to move up into the nest boxes. So if you know you have a problem area, whether it's underneath an aviary system, it's in a, a darkened corner, um, if you can do something to try to remove those areas from the birds, um, that is something that can be much more effective. 
So like many things, um, particularly with behavior, um, I don't really have the sort of golden answer for you to do this and you will succeed in reducing floor eggs. It's, this is an area that was sort of neglected for a while in terms of trying to understand this behavior and how birds um, interact with nest boxes and other areas of, of these cage-free systems. It's an area, as I said, are, are starting to get looked at again. Um, and I think that's really important, especially incorporating strain differences and looking at some of the, the more modern genetics that we have available. So I just wanted to tell you about a couple of studies that have happened recently or are, are ongoing. Um, so there was a study that looked at using experienced hens. And so they put about 1.5% of the flock um, were older birds who actually had experience with nest box use and used nest boxes. And the idea was to try to use those as a trainer um, and try to reduce the labor of, of human trainers going in. Um, but they actually found that there was no effect on floor eggs, whether the birds had these experienced trainers or not. Um, and the, the authors really sort of argued that, you know, they, they just use one and a half percent of the flock, and that just might not be enough, given the size of the flocks, um, to influence other birds. And so they, they, were, they were suggesting that more work should be done looking at perhaps higher percentages. Um, obviously, this has some biosecurity downsides. Um, and so and this, nothing really has happened since then. This, was, this study came out a couple of years ago. Um, in terms of the training techniques, though, people have really been trying to understand how can we do this um, sort of training in a way that is very systematic um, and reduces the use of human labor. So I'm trying to cut out some of those labor costs. Um, and so there, there are some studies currently ongoing, so I don't have any results to give you, but they're looking at comparing humans and robots um, as a means to disrupt floor laying. So they're basically these little robots, perhaps you have seen some um, that have used in poultry housing before, just these sort of like little, think of the, um, the automatic vacuum cleaners, that sort of robot type thing, where you can program in paths um, for the robot to move throughout the house. And then you can start having a robot move through um, those really common laying times to try to disrupt those hens. And so even though that's a really short-term solution, if you can have something like a robot moving through, you can have it move through the whole house, you can do it in a very systematic way, um, and you can do that every day um, and, and not have to worry about that laborious cost that comes with that sort of training. Um, and then there's also a lot of research right now being done with pullets um, and trying to understand um, strain differences in pullets and how different ways that we house pullets, what are the aspects of pullet housing that are really important, and how do those things affect the pullets, but also what are the effects later on uh, when we move hens into layer systems. So those are all things that are happening right now. There's, there are quite a few labs um, that are working on that. Um, and I just wanted to give you a quick update in terms of what we're doing here at UC Davis. Um, and so we're doing a lot of this pullet work as well. Um, so we're examining effects of vertical structures. So how much vertical structure do they need? Um, does the type really matter to them uh, during pullet housing? So from day one all the way through till they're moved into a layer system. Um, so vertical structures in pullet housing and looking at the effects of that on pullet and layer development, cognition and health. And we're specifically looking at keel bone damage there. Um, but these sort of, these sort of um, studies have wide ranging effects. So understanding, you know, is there an effect on cognitive ability, spatial ability that clearly would have an issue, um, a connection to whether or not they can find nest boxes and, and how they utilize those spaces uh, as adults. Um, we're looking at some nesting design preferences. So trying to understand particularly the sort of importance to birds um, of, of cover um, so putting curtains on or not, and then also um, what substrates um, and how those two sort of things interact with each other. And we are here um, to help you. So please, you know, if, if there's something that I can answer for you more specifically, um, you know, again, kind of a wishy-washy, some, some suggestions of things to do, uh, but we're not really sure how well some of these things work or not, um, especially on a commercial scale. Um, so as as Dr. Murillo mentioned earlier, a lot of these things are done on research scale. 
uh, small group sizes, and we're not really sure how well they, they sort of go out. So if you have if you see some of these techniques and you want to use them, and you're having some difficulty, please feel free to contact us. Um, you know, we have multiple people here who can cover different issues, and we are here to help you. So, you know, let us know. And you have my email address here. Um, and otherwise, I'm happy to take questions.